Uh, thank you all for coming today. We're really pleased that all of you could come to attend this event. This is a forum on the paradox of obesity, and it's uh, co-sponsored by the Berkeley Food Institute and also the Atkins Center for Weight and Health, and um, also the Nutrition Policy Institute, which is associated with the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division of UC. So we really appreciate your coming today. Um, my name is Ann Thrupp, and I'm the executive director of the Berkeley Food Institute here on campus. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Um, the panel is part of a series of lectures that we're having, or actually panels and forums that are participatory in nature, and that we're organizing these uh, monthly to address uh, contemporary issues in food and agriculture systems at, at different levels, local level, national level, and international. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Berkeley Food Institute, BFI's mission is to catalyze and, trans and support transformative change in food systems to promote diversity, resilience, justice, and health. Um, and we're doing that by creating and supporting linkages between research, education, policymaking, and practice in, in social movements. Um, and BFI serves as a hub to facilitate connections among many people working on these issues. So the question is, why are we addressing this particular topic? Obviously, it fits in with that mission, with that, those issues that we're concerned about. Many of us are concerned about um, throughout society and on this campus. Um, differing viewpoints have emerged in understanding and addressing obesity. It's clearly an issue that's gaining gain so much attention. Um, but while dietary aspects of obesity are often discussed, Less frequently addressed are the complex causes of, of obesity and the roles of socioeconomic and political context and other factors that affect obesity. So we also are trying to address what policies and actions are needed to address this important issue. We hope this panel, we expect this panel will shed some light on these complexities. So we're pleased um, to and honored to have Pat Crawford to moderate this, um, this panel. And she's the director of the Atkins Center for Weight and Health. She's also a cooperative extension nutrition specialist and adjunct professor in the School of Public Health here at Berkeley. And she has many distinguished accomplishments, which you can read about in your program. I, th if I, I think if I read all of our bio, the bio sketches of all of our people, we'd have, we'd take up the whole event. So we, if you need more, uh, we'd like more information about the people that's in her program. Um, so uh, Pat is going to introduce our four distinguished panelists, and we're also very happy that they can join us here. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to just also briefly describe the format. Pat is going to make the introductions, and, um, and then um, each speaker will make a, sh a short overview of their perspectives on this issue, just about five minutes each. And then Pat is going to facilitate some questions with the panelists and then open it up to the audience so that you'll have an opportunity to exchange your questions and ideas. Um, at 5.30, we'll break for reception and um, then invite you to enjoy some refreshments. And um, so I also, before I hand this over to Pat, I'd just like to thank again the Center for Weight and Health and the Nutrition Policy Institute for collaborating in this and also thank Rosie, Rosalie Fanchel and Nora Gilbert and others who've been involved in organizing. So um, I'll turn it over to Pat. Okay, thank you, Pat. Okay, well, thank you, Anne, and thank you all for, for coming. This is uh, going to be a very exciting interactive panel, one that's a little different from other lectures you might come to at Berkeley because so many people in the audience bring such rich perspectives. I already can point out people and, and uh, imagine what your questions might be. So I think it's that diversity that, that really brings excitement to the topic, that people are coming from different disciplines, not only here on the stage, but in the audience. So obesity is the greatest epidemic of our time. Um, an epidemic is, is um, it's a rampant, widespread increase. It's an outbreak. And it's only just over 30 years old. So this has happened during our watch and during our lives. Um, the first I knew about it was when I was doing some um, cohort studies and I was waiting to see what the numbers looked like from N. Haynes and how many children were above certain percentiles. And the numbers, they just didn't come, and they didn't come, and we didn't know why. And later, months and months, they were delayed. And later we found out they didn't believe the big jump 
that had occurred. It was the first big jump in childhood obesity during those early years, just over 30 years ago. And they checked, and they checked the numbers, and they checked the data collectors, and they reran everything because it didn't look right. Well, that was just the first little jump. And the next year, when they had an even bigger jump, they were ready for it. They knew that we were in a different period, a different time. And the greatest jumps were occurring in children, which is so unusual. So this was a really unusual, it was an important epidemic, and nobody knew what to do. Um, <clears throat> there we were, you know, really struggling with, with uh, trying to understand what happened all of a sudden. So if you remember, one of the, the first things that occurred was that, well, it wasn't one of the first, but as, as time went on, we began to see that there was a paradox here, that the, the ones who were growing heaviest were often the low-income children rather than the higher-income children. Because before this epidemic, it was the higher-income folks that were heavier and the lower income folks that were leaner. And that, you know, if you think of those old depression pictures, you know, of the people who didn't have enough to eat, that's the picture that you saw were these very thin uh, people who were malnourished and hungry. So that first paradox is kind of that flip-flop of those that were poorer and more often food insecure and hungry were becoming the heaviest. And the second paradox, and I hope we'll address each of these today, is one that you think of um, in, in every lecture that I give and I talk about where the US stands in, in comparison to other nations. If, if you're not really following this topic as closely, you don't realize that we're number one. We're number one, or sometimes they say number two, because Mexico has just creeped a little bit higher in obesity rates than the US. But that's a paradox. It doesn't make sense in a country with so many resources and so much education um, that we would be number one. So we have to really understand better the context within which this is occurring. And today, that's the exciting part about the panel, is they'll each bring a different perspective on that very context and, and why this is happening. So we have Lori True, who's sitting at the end here, who's the executive director of the California WIC Association, who will bring us a perspective from understanding paraprofessionals, low-income folks, young moms and young children. Next to her, we have um, Rodney Taylor, who is the director of nutrition services at the Riverside Unified School District and is doing some really interesting things at the and with children at the you know in the in school age levels. And next to Rodney, we have Julie Guthman, who's a geographer and a professor of social sciences at UC Santa Cruz, who has written extensively on this topic, trying to understand obesity from a variety of other directions. Um, and finally, at the end here, we have Hilary Seligman, who's an internist, associate professor of medicine, also of epidemiology and biostatistics at UCSF. And she is an expert in food insecurity and diabetes and the intersection of di disease and health. And so each one will offer a perspective here first. We'll have questions after they all sit down. And what's unique is they won't talk for very long because we really want the dialogue. We want you to be engaged in, in the very problems that we're also you know, driven to better understand today. So I think we're going to start with um, Hillary. Is that correct? OK. Would you like to come up or sit down? You can choose. Uh, I'm happy to sit down. I think okay. it might make it more fun, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> So my research focuses on poverty and dietary intake and the health implications that result from living in poverty, um, particularly focused on obesity and diabetes. And really what I focus on is what is it about poverty that predisposes people to obesity and diabetes and other diet-sensitive chronic diseases? And that's a really complex question to answer. But what I've tried to do is to isolate food insecurity from poverty in order to simplify the question to something that we can understand um, 
e more easily uh, at an empiric level. So first, let me define food insecurity for you in uh, not the formal definition, but the informal definition that I like to use is um, going hungry because of an inability to afford food or the coping strategies that people use in order to avoid that physical sensation of hunger. Again, because they don't have the ability to afford food. So the question is, why is food insecurity so tightly linked to, a, to obesity, at least among women? Um, and why is it so closely linked to other diet-sensitive chronic diseases? So I'm going to leave you in this five minutes I have to talk with three reasons. Um, and the most obvious is poor nutrition. We all know that um, obesogenic foods tend to cost less. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say we all know that. That's actually quite controversial. There are very reasonable people who would disagree that healthy foods cost more. What I do think we can agree on is that calorie for calorie, healthy foods cost more. And then if you factor in the additional time needed to prepare healthy foods, there is no doubt that healthy foods cost more. And it is clear that food insecurity results in poor dietary intake. There's good evidence for this, particularly among women who are most likely to get obese in the context of food insecurity. So this is the obvious problem, but I also think it oversimplifies the intersection between food insecurity, or you could say poverty and obesity. And there are two other things that I think are equally as important or potentially even more important. This, so the second thing, the first one being poor nutrition, the second one would be dietary behaviors that are used initially adaptively to cope with not knowing where your next meal is going to come from, but which if, which if it gets sustained over a long period of time, poverty doesn't happen for six weeks, it happens for years and decades and a lifetime, when these coping strategies are sustained, then they predispose people to obesity. So let me give you an example. One example would be these cycles of binging and fasting that take place as food becomes available and unavailable. Uh, so you might eat a lot, more than you otherwise would because you've had a recent food shortage, or you may eat a lot because you anticipate that there's going to be a food shortage in the near future. Uh, also related to this would be this extreme avoidance of food waste. And um, also maybe related to this is this concept of the kids have to eat, 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 eat everything that we have uh, because we may not know where our meals are going to come from next week. So that's the second. And the third one, oh, and I'll mention here that um, I, I very much feel that the dietary behaviors that get laid down among children and adolescents in response to food insecurity persist throughout their lives in many cases. And so when we when we allow children to grow up in food insecure environments, even if they are able to make it out of poverty, sometimes these eating behaviors persist. The third thing I want to mention is stress. And I think stress in the context of food insecurity is really under-researched and under-talked about. Um, if you just think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's at the very bottom. There is nothing more stressful, I think, than not knowing where your next meal is going to come from. And particularly, I think, among women, this stress in the context of the nutritional changes that happen with food insecurity, I think all act synergistically to predispose people to stress. So that's sort of the conceptual framework that I work under and tries to highlight for you the very complex factors that I think help to intertwine food insecurity uh, and obesity. Great. Good, good beginning here. Okay. We're going to turn right next to Julie. Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank Anne and everybody else for who was involved in inviting me. Um, and, um, well, I think my remarks are going to be challenging because my aim in writing the book I wrote about obesity, my aim today is to kind of shake up some of our taken for granted assumptions about obesity. And I want to start by saying how I came to study obesity because I'm certainly, I don't come at all from nutrition or for the, from the medical profession or even from kind of the behavioral sciences. I came because I've been studying alternative food movements since about 1995. And when, sometime in the mid 2000s, I started noticing that in alternative food movements, people were taking up the cause of obesity. And I was very curious about that. And so, to make a long story short, I finally came to the conclusion that obesity was a problem to which the alternative food movement could be a solution. So um, it's kind of that framework that made me think about obesity. Um, and so I think with obesity, we have a problem of what's called problem closure. And by that, I mean that we've 
that the, the def definition of the problem of obesity has been framed in terms of what are socially acceptable solutions, such as like let's have more farmers markets or more walkable sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And the problems of obesity have, uh, has been, there's many uh, embedded assumptions in the way researchers go about studying obesity. So my research suggests, and my research is, I don't have a specific research project. Most of my research has been reviewing other studies, okay, on, in terms of obesity. I have other research that I do primary research. But my research suggests that we really don't understand the causes or the consequences of obesity all that well. So regarding the latter, regarding the consequences, I don't actually think that, that obesity is the public health crisis we've made it out to be. Um, the relationship between obesity and poor health is weakly understood. I'm not saying we don't know anything. Of course, we know something. But it's not as clear cut as we're led to believe. And just to give you one example, um, uh, uh, statisticians from the Center for Disease Control have been doing epidemiological studies for a long time relating mortality to obesity. And they f consistently find that people in the overweight and mildly obese category actually outlive people in the normal category. Um, presumably because fat is protective as people get older. Um, there's another obesity paradox that I, there's, one, there's been a couple articles been read, written about this, maybe not a lot, that suggests that people, that shows that people with diabetes who are in the normal weight category don't live as long as people who are, are bigger. So maybe there's something about the fatness that's protective around diabetes. I don't know what in the medical profession how much they examine those things. So at the risk of being glib, and this is glib, I want to suggest that if we're really concerned about premature t death, we ought to be more concerned with gun violence than perhaps obesity, particularly if we're concerned about African Americans and Latinos, et cetera. Regarding the cause of obesity, the science is really far from settled. Um, even the dietary causes are not um, well understood, as, and that's indicated in the, in the debates that still persist about whether calories or carbohydrates are the things that we ought to be worried about. Um, calories, it's important to know, is an equivalency. There are no calories in a piece of chocolate cake, right? There's grams of protein and carbohydrates and sugars, but there's no, calories is an equivalency. That you, you understand a calorie when you burn that piece of chocolate cake. So we don't really understand how calories you know, uh, we do, I mean, people understand how calories metabolize in the body, but calories aren't just this obvious kind of um, object that make us fat directly. Um, and the carbohydrates are most associated with altered insulin response, which is related to the production of fat. But there's a lot of emerging evidence that it's not only our, our lack of understanding or not, or not, let's say, maybe not lack of understanding, that there's, it's not settled. Um, that it, it, there's emerging, excuse me, emerging, oh my goodness gracious. Oh, I can do it, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the emerging evidence for all sorts of other things besides diet that may be um, involved in obesity. Chronic stress, um, chronic stress in ways that, that w with circulating stress hormones seems to be related to abdominal fat, sleep deprivation. Circadian rhythms, there was an amazing mouse study a couple years ago that shows that mouse, m mice that were, could eat whatever they want over a 24 hour period got much fatter than those mm -hmm. that ate the same amount in a limited eight hour period. So there's something about circadian rhythms. Um, all the stuff coming out about the, the biome and the gut biota, biota that seems to play a role in obesity. And so, and so therefore, now there's a new study that came out that showed that um, children that took a lot of antibiotics when they were young get bigger. So there's something about gut biota. Um, antidepressants, read a, a bottle of antidepressants that says it may make you fat, right? Um, the one that I focus a lot on the, in the book um, is environmental toxins. And there's a, a emerging evidence that environmental toxins, pe various pesticides, fumigants, fire retardants, et cetera, have a role in obesity. And crucially, most crucially, these are the exposures are to women while they are pregnant, and the, and the manifestation of obesity doesn't happen until the children are born or grow older, et cetera. So there's something really, so this is an intergenerational effect that has nothing to do with diet, 
right? So the, the, the crucial studies have shown that mice are much, um, when, when the mother was exposed to a chemical and the, the mice were fed the exact same diet, the same calories, the ones that were exposed became much bigger in adulthood than those who weren't. Um, so many of those co possible causes have socioeconomic dimensions. But if we don't really quite have a grasp on the proximate causes of obesity, then it raises a, a lot of questions about how we are going to think about it socioeconomically, even though I would say a lot of those are socioeconomic. Okay, I got it. I did it. <laughs> 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 okay, Rodney. Okay, so I'm going to give you a d different twist. Uh, has nothing to do with research. has everything to do with everyday life. Right. Uh, and I'm going to speak to you about what the experts have said and how we've responded and more importantly, what I see every day. Um, all of the points that were brought up are very real. Um, 30 years ago, they told us that our children were obese, that it was becoming an, uh, an, a, an epidemic, and we needed to do something. We needed for children to consume more fresh fruits and vegetables. We needed to teach them the importance of nutrition education, and the third prong would be physical activity. Um, I'm going to argue that there's a very real, very real obesity crisis in America. And if you happen to be African American or Latino or American Indian, uh, that it's even worse. And some of that has to do with poverty. I would argue, though, that if you solved, if we solved the hunger problem, we would solve the obesity problem. And here's my premise for that, is I'm going to argue that uh, in low-income families where uh, parents don't have the wherewithal to provide um, access to meals every day. In those same neighborhoods, and you can go to uh, Oakland and, and see, um, for every supermarket you're going to find seven or eight liquor stores or churches, um, there's no access to these fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, for one. And absent of that, instead of drink, drinking uh, juice or eating fruit, they're consuming more sodas, more calories, more sugar. I read a study today that 30%, 37% of our intake is sugars, uh, which play a direct role in us being overweight. And on the school campuses, I can tell you that that's what we see kids eat. Um, um, so here's what I want to talk about. These are all the paradoxes, all of the things that we have to consider when we address uh, childhood obesity or obesity at large, and um, how I think that we have to attack it, because uh, hunger's an issue, access, poverty. Um, when you don't have access, uh, that you, you, you heard the issue with sleep deprivation, with stress. Uh, I, I just wrote a paper to my superintendent that said, common core, yes, but common sense, uh, please. And, <laughs> and, and what I'm alluding to quite simply is that um, in schools, during the testing period, one week during the testing period, we asked that all kids be fed. So the connotation is that a kid that eats will perform well on tests. There's no nexus that demonstrates that, no research whatsoever that demonstrates that, but it does tell you something that's enlightening, that educators believe that there's a nexus between nutrition and education. And so the first thing I'd, I would argue is that if we're serious about education for all children, then we'll ensure that every kid has access to meals. And the school system is the best system there is for it. Our kids are there six, six hours a day. They're there for breakfast lunch and snack. So we have the ability to make sure that a child has access, irrespective of their socioeconomics. And understand, I'm not talking about just those at risk. My kids came up in a uh, middle-income family. Uh, their problem was they'd rather sleep than eat. They rode the bus. Uh, the bus got to school late. They didn't have access to breakfast. They would be hungry right at school start. But let me tell you the genius in our education system. We let five-year-olds go to school in the morning and decide between whether they're going to go out to play or eat. 
which one do you think they choose? <laughs> so this kid that didn't have excess is now uh, even hungrier in class, fidgety, and so forth. And if uh, you know any teachers, they'll tell you that they're always bringing snacks. And the reason is when a child says they had a headache or a stomach ache, in uh, teacher's language, it means they're hungry. These are very real uh, uh, examples of what happens every day. So it's a social justice issue in my mind because no child in America should uh, not have access to uh, healthy meals each day. I think that, uh, as, as, as a good doctor alluded to, and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, if we don't meet the very basic need, then we can't expect that every child in our country is going to have an opportunity to go to the UCs and excel or whatever their, their chosen uh, product. We've got food production that we need to deal with, uh, farm working, nutrition education, physical activity, livable communities, violence. Um, we have to train. We've, we've got three decades of mothers who didn't grow up in the kitchen, didn't have home economics, and it's not easy enough to say you need to cook meals at home. They don't know how to cook. And then um, our policy, we, we, we hit on it a minute ago. That I think it's a three-pronged approach, research, policy, and grassroots efforts that you'll hear about what we're doing on the ground because those are very real. That's the incubator for what works and how to get access and how to um, modify eating behaviors because that's what, we, that's what this is really about, is teaching children not to drink 20 ounce Gatorades and eat chips for lunch. Let's get a wholesome meal. And then um, the cost, the cost, of doing nothing um, is more than um, we want to deal with 10, 20 years from now. We don't act now, we're going to have a problem. Thank you, Rodney. Okay. All right. everyone, and uh, I too want to thank everyone for coming. What a great crowd, and uh, to the Food Institutes, plural, uh, for inviting us. Uh, like Rodney, um, I'm sort of more coming from the front lines and um, more of a practitioner perspective. <coughs> the WIC program in California serves about 1.4 million uh, low-income women, infants, and children across the state. Uh, for those of you who don't know the program, it provides a so-called food prescription uh, in the form of a, a, a mar market basket or set of checks specific for specific foods that can be purchased in grocery stores. Uh, but we actually do a lot more than that. We provide uh, nutrition counseling, very extensive breastfeeding support and encouragement to our moms and babies, and also a screening and referral to healthcare and social services that they may need. Um, and, the and I think I could really echo uh, what we've heard so far. Um, very low incomes. Many of our uh, participants, about 60% of WIC families live at 100% or below the poverty line. Um, 63% of all infants served in California are served, are WIC enrolled. So it's a pervasive poverty in the young families. Um, in some studies uh, in Los Angeles, which serves a third of the population, uh, close to 40% are depressed. So food is not uh, number one on their list. They're, they're stressed out and depressed. Uh, and so there's multiple, you know, there's multiple layers of problems. Uh, but I do think, uh, so some, some things about obesity. Um, obviously WIC and the school lunch program and the federal nutrition assistance programs are sort of trying to address the obesity and nutrition problem we have in America at the proximal level, very close to the problem where you put your fork in your mouth. And uh, despite all the complex analyses and it's a messy problem with lots of factors involved, obesity and hunger, and global warming, they're really similar. Uh, the fact of the matter is people eat every day and they're putting food in their mouths and there's a, there's a role of nutrition. So those of you who are nutritionists who sometimes feel like this is not a nutrition problem, it's not a nutrition problem. It's a social justice problem, it's a corporate greed problem, it's a democracy problem, it's a campaign finance problem. But good news, it's also a nutrition problem because people <laughs> have to eat every day, three times, usually, we hope. If not, they're grazing too much. Uh, and so uh, we have a role, and I think it's a very exciting role uh, to play. Uh, 
I think there is a, a real paradox that obesity, sh you know, and this uh, over abundance of food and the ubiquitousness of poorly uh, manufactured junk food in our environments uh, somehow impacts the low income population disproportionately. Um, problem analysis and definition is very important in any kind of messy problem, but you also can't get paralyzed by the analysis and you have to act. And those of you who watched the FDR Teddy Roosevelt series, uh, you know, that it was very inspiring to see FDR take on the depression. It's like, I don't know if it's going to work, but we're going to try it. And I think many uh, food activists uh, like myself and many of you in the audience, you know, what we're doing may not work. Uh, hopefully it won't uh, cause unintended consequences or harm, but you got to try something. And uh, a lot of the creative and low budget things that are people are trying are pretty darn amazing. Uh, for example, uh, Rodney was telling me that his, he's going to purchase produce and uh, get the low income stores that are in these food swamps. I call them food swamps, not necessarily deserts. Uh, he'll <laughs> supply them with the produce so they can stock their shelves because the, the supply chain is so screwed up in these neighborhoods. Uh, so there is a real urgency to deal with solutions, and I like to think about obesity more in terms of diabetes, quite frankly, because uh, I think that's the real killer. And uh, it's really a, a nasty, horrible disease, and when in the WIC program, it's, it's very personal to the 3,000 people who work for them, because they have it, their grandmothers have it, their fathers are dying young of it, it's right in your face. And it can't be denied that it's a serious problem, and it's linked to obesity. Um, and I think there's two, you know, it's also, there's multi layers of, of solutions, and there's different kinds of approaches. Some people like to take the long term approach. Yes, we need to take on corporate greed. Yes, we need to start a revolution and abolish capitalism. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, while we're waiting for that, <laughs> there's things we could be doing. And believe me, I graduated from Berkeley, so I wanted to start the revolution. <laughs> Didn't happen. Uh, but I have seen, I, I, I basically, thanks to people in the room, you know, stuck with food. And food is a fabulous uh, community organizing tool. Uh, you may start somebody off on, you know, starting a food pantry or running a small community garden like I did when I first, even before I went to school, or uh, working on a farm. And it all seems kind of, you know, elitist and not really related to low income issues. But low income fa families that come to WIC have the same kind of aspirations about wanting to feed their kids healthy food and wanting to participate in delicious eating and using their traditional food ways from their ethnic backgrounds to cook delicious meals. And they too want the same things you and I want in terms of. Uh, eating and cooking together and all those things. And they have a right to that. It's just as much their birthright as it is ours. To end, I'd like to just read, um, you can see the, the aspirations people have. You may have seen this in the New York Times. It was in the Upshot column. Uh, the guys from Upshot looked at, uh, had an analyst look at the Google searches for the worst county, the worst environment county in the most hard hit by poverty environmental degradation and the richest county. And it's amazing uh, what searches came up for the worst county in the nation. I'll just read you a few. The top one was pre-diabetic diet, uh, antichrist, 38 revolver, ways to lower blood pressure, diabetic diets, dog Benadryl. What the heck is dog Benadryl? <laughs> dog Severe stress. itching. 1,500 calorie diet, 1,200 calorie diet, causes of high blood pressure, calorie diet plan, low carb diet, what is normal blood sugar? Those were among the top searches, uh, including the Antichrist uh, <laughs> and revolvers, okay? <laughs> and they were nowhere to be seen in the, in the high income area. So there's a huge desperate need. People need information and they have a right to the to the best information they can get. It's the nutrition problem, our field's problem that it's so confused and they're getting a zillion messages. It's not just the food in industry. We have a problem as nutritionists that we're sending a zillion messages. Oh, first it's carbs, now it's gluten, you know, then it's this, then it's that. But there's a desperate need for this information and they're not getting it. 
and they deserve to get it. They need to make an informed decision. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all. What a diverse group this is. And, and I didn't mention to you all, but the descriptions of their backgrounds are all in the program. So that's why we, we move so quickly past it. So I thought I'd, I'd start with a few questions and then we're going to open it up to all of you. Yes. Uh, I don't know. The, the studies we've done basically just screen mobs for depression using the Edinburgh scale and then, uh, and then try to refer them to these, quote, mental health system, which doesn't exist. But uh, it doesn't ask them why they're depressed. It just tries to figure out how severely depressed they are so they can get some help. But it's a vicious cycle. It's, it's depressing to be poor in an affluent society. It's depressing to be single and have two young children and not enough uh, resources to raise them. So there's lots of reasons people depress. And it also could be uh, peri perinatal depression related to the hormones after birth. So there's a lot of reasons for depression. Could be the, they're depressed yeah. because they're fat. Yep. It's, it's, that's clear. There's a high risk of yeah. depression if you're obese. OK, so we'll come back to some of these other questions. But I want to start with one that's a little bit related to that depression. And I thought maybe Hillary could address it. That some studies are showing the consequences of obesity being so debilitating, the physical consequences and the diabetes, which of course is her area. Um, but also there are psychological issues and social stigma with being obese. And, and so Hillary, I wonder if you've had experiences um, or insights into the psychosocial you know, cycling of, of these very issues like depression. And, so it's very clear from um, quantitative studies that there is a very high risk of depression and other mental health disorders among people who are food insecure, even if you compare them to people of similar incomes who are not food insecure. And the question when we see these associations over and over um, is really which is driving which? So are people depressed because they're food insecure? Or are they food insecure because they become depressed and therefore they're less employable, they aren't re-upping their benefits when their benefits expire, they aren't enrolling in the Affordable Care Act, et cetera, and all of these things would be protecting them against depression. We don't know the answer to that. And in fact, it's probably bimodal. Food insecurity probably does make people depressed and depression probably does make people food insecure. Beyond that, um, I would say that we know that both obesity weighs very heavily on people, makes them less employable, for example, um, and we know that food insecurity makes people very um, um, stressed and depressed as well. And I think this is particularly important in the context of making this link between obesity and the diabetes epidemic, that when you think about stress in this context, stress very much is associated with that kind of visceral adiposity, that, that um, fat around your, your abdominal organs that predisposes people to obesity, I mean to diabetes. So it's not just the benign kind of obesity where you know, you're obese but you're probably gonna be okay. This is the obesity that predisposes people to diabetes and to early mortality. So I think we really have to keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Yeah, okay, that, that's, that helps clarify some of what we the others have mentioned, so thank you. And then I had a question for Rodney, too. You know, it's well known that obesity disproportionately affects different races and ethnicities and income groups, and particularly is high in those groups, but can you tell me how in your, you know, in the school district, how you try to deal directly with poverty and the lack of affordability of healthy foods, and maybe tell us just a little bit about the demographics of your district? Well, in Riverside, we're the 15th largest school district in the state with 43,000 students. Of those 43,000 students, 65% come from at-risk homes, and those are kids at or below the poverty level. I can tell you that uh, it's very real that the chance is that those kids did not have breakfast. Um, and that's a tragedy it, as a, for a young kid, any young kid, um, there's a certain indignity with being poor. And I can tell you that, not what I think, 
I was actually raised very poor. I know hunger far more intimately than I care to discuss. Um, so I can tell you that a child that's hungry can't concentrate. I, I, I talk to educators all the time. It doesn't matter if you give me a notebook, computer, or what you give me. If you don't uh, meet that basic need on Maslow's hierarchy, I can't pay attention, okay? Uh, I can tell you that out of seven out of 10 of our children, almost seven out of 10 come from at-risk homes and that's not counting those that we know are homeless. And uh, we know that in our middle and high schools that kids will go hungry rather than be identified as hungry. So many of them drop out of school early. So there's this vicious cycle that goes on and on. Um, so our, our approach is we wanna take little Johnny at five years old and we want to teach him to be a lifelong healthy eater. And we do that by providing access to fresh fruits and vegetables, engaging and encouraging the kids to eat the colors and uh, teaching them. We have three nutritionists on staff as well as the chefs. And so if we're not taking them to the farm, we're bringing farmers in the classroom, nutrition educators and the chef working with them. I, I think that if we're going to overcome obesity, we're going to teach new eating behaviors with children while they're young. So that as they get older, they make uh, healthy choices. We want to teach children to become lifelong healthy eaters. But let's, just for a minute, let's talk about the connection between obesity and diabetes because that's one that really hit, rings my bell. If you happen, well, the experts say that one in three children born after 2000, if nothing's done, one out of three children will have diabetes in their lifetime. If that child happens to be African American or Latino, that's two in three. Now I have two sons, no grandchildren yet, I can't even get them married off. Um, <laughs> but imagine if they had four kids, it pretty much assures me that two of them are gonna have diabetes. Um, we should be concerned about that, regardless of the ethnicity and regardless of the socioeconomic. Because I can tell you, I've worked in affluent school districts. Kids are left to their own devices. They don't make very good choices either. So this, this, um, uh, we can talk about obesity and hunger, but we really, it's about teaching a whole generation of children how to uh, value their body, to take care of it teach them how to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Julie, did you want to comment yeah, on I, that? Yeah, I just want to talk about this obesity and diabetes link, because I, you know, I don't want to give you all the wrong impression. I very much am concerned about diabetes, and I'm very, I'm very concerned about poverty. Um, but again, what's the connection between obesity and diabetes? Is obesity causing diabetes, or is diabetes causing obesity? Or is something else causing both, right? Yeah. Right, so um, and so this goes back to a question you said. I mean, if there's about the visceral fat, fat, we should be paying more attention to what exactly is pathological, and less about body size per se. There are plenty people who are thin who can have a really crappy diet. They can eat themselves to death and not be called into account. So that's kind of the, if there's no other point you remember for me because you're going to think she's a nut. <laughs> there's no other point. It's like I think. It's it, it's it, we should be concerned with the pathology, not with size. And this goes back to the psychology thing. I mean, what is, if indeed fat people are depressed because they're fat, I mean, what does this constant drumbeat of this rhetoric of an obesity uh, epidemic doing? So I really think we need to be very cognizant and reflexive about the consequences of naming obesity, fatness, body size, difference as a problem. People are different. Let's, let's call the pathology. If it's diabetes, fine, not obesity. No, no that's important. And yeah. Um, yeah. Hillary Absolutely. started with, uh, you know, her field is um, largely more diabetes than obesity. Mm -hmm. And then Rodney mentioned how that's the bottom line in his mind. And Lori said in her mind, that was the bottom line. And now I think we're having concurrence with Julie. So I think that in itself is a very important uh, area of kind of reframing the obesity epidemic into the real, as you called it, the pathology, I guess, of yeah. the, 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 the disease that um, is involved. And, and certainly those are the numbers that are, are staggering right now. I, I, when you're reaching an audience and saying how many are obese, 
it isn't as nearly as a strong of words. I mean, people think, well, yes, people are heavier, but what does that mean? But when you say the new number that's out on adolescents now is that nearly one quarter of all adolescents in the United States are pre-diabetic or diabetic, that just has such a important ring to it that, I mean, you can't just pass on that. Um, and so it, I think we've come across I, I think it's interesting the reframing that we're doing right now. So Can let I me provide a yeah, bit of a counterpoint ahead. to that. Mm -hmm. I, had, I, I see this um, movement to, to away from obesity as the problem and towards diabetes. And, and I understand that in a way because diabetes, trust me, diabetes is terrible. The consequences are terrible. There's a lot of morbidity and mortality associated with it. But I hesitate to throw away obesity as a problem because as long as there is a stigma associated with obesity, it doesn't matter what the consequences are. It's a problem for people. Mm -hmm. And so we can't entirely shift our debate to the debate around diabetes because we miss the psychological consequences of being obese, uh -huh. which isn't to say that we shouldn't concentrate on diabetes because I think we should, and that's my field. But we can't throw away the obesity problem. I'm glad that you're bringing this up, that's yes. But, but we can't throw away the obesity problem because okay. it is very clear that obesity is a primary driver of the diabetes okay. epidemic. Okay, so we have the two issues here back again. Yeah, Lori. Yeah, and, and, and about this issue of stigma, which is, is very sensitive, and I know that uh, there's a lot of attention paid to, you know, not, not saying the O word and, and not talking about, not saying fat. But I think one of the things that we've learned in the WIC program is sometimes you have to call a spade a spade. And for many years, we minced around the issue of breastfeeding in the WIC program. And essentially, our message to mom was, you know, it's like you can breastfeed or you can bottle feed. You know, one or the other, they're both fine. You know, I don't want to hurt your feelings about bottle feeding and using infant formula because, you know, God forbid it, you're stigmatized. And we're not here to stigmatize you. And finally, essentially, they got over that. And mm -hmm. now we basically call it making an informed decision. Okay, not a choice, making an informed decision. We're gonna here to give you the information about the risks and benefits of infant formula feeding versus breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we're actually kind of getting there about uh, obesity mm -hmm. as well in the WIC program in that there is a disconnect in women's minds about the size that they are and the size that their infants are, and they are not actually aware that their infants are very obese. And so we're doing this whole consciousness raising thing about, you know, mm -hmm. guess what? Your child could be at risk. Not everyone who's obese is gonna get diabetes, but the fact of the matter is 80% of diabetics, type two, are obese. So there's a definite con yeah. con connection, and you have a, we have a responsibility to tell people about that. Mm -hmm. Good, and Rodney wants to wrap this up. Yeah, the, you know, we started off, at, at least in my mind, I started off concerned with obesity and uh, diabetes is always there. They're both there, and they're, they're very real. Um, this, the conversation has changed a lot in school food service around food. Um, we're concerned about what's in our food. Um, if you look at processed food especially, um, which is largely what we're feeding our kids, so when we take a look at what are the causes of obesity and we acknowledge that food and beverages may play a role, then we look at our behavior. And I can tell you that the school food service industry is slow to acknowledge that we played a role in that. You know, all of the calories, all the sugars, we were selling sodas and Hostess Twinkies and Taco Bell and McDonald's and everything else. And we're largely moving away from that. And the goal is uh, to modify eating behaviors to get feed kids to know where their food came from. They don't know what a peach is. They don't know what that fuzzy thing in kiwi is. Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't know the difference between a, a root vegetable or tree fruit. So it, it's a lot around behavior and teaching and getting back to the way it was when I went to school. And that is I could smell the food cooking in the cafeteria. You know, there's only so many things in meatloaf. The less, uh, <laughs> the, the less that's in your food, the healthier it is for you. Uh, we should be current, concerned about uh, the chemicals that are used in um, both on our, our uh, fruits and vegetables, but even concerned with uh, the antibiotics used in 
uh, fruit, I mean, in our chicken and beef and so on. So we have largely ch not veered away from obesity or diabetes, mm -hmm. but uh, the conversation seems to be more on food and getting back to cooking, you know, mm -hmm. teaching our folks to cook, uh, converting our cafeterias that aren't built to cook. Mm -hmm. There's a big bond that was passed in Oakland to make that happen. But uh, my good friend Jennifer in Oakland likes to tell the story that uh, with the difference in eight miles, they can uh, forecast a life expectancy based on the zip code. <laughs> That's largely true in any community. You take the zip code and look at the socioeconomics, look at the education, and look at everything else, and what you're going to find in the low-income areas is a shorter life expectancy. And so call it, what it is, whatever you want. What I see is a need to educate, largely in the way we did with tobacco. Uh, I think it's as serious as tobacco. It will be a series of tobacco if we don't do anything. And we have a model to learn from. And I can tell you in schools, food service across the country, we're focused on change, transforming the food system. But that in and of itself, we can't do it only in schools. We do it with the WIC program. We do it with, in academia. Uh, we're doing it with our partners in uh, public health and so on. That's that's the challenge before us. Yeah, we're going to wrap this up with one more question that has more to do with public policy. And, and Rodney touched on it because he was talking about the fact that, you know, we used to give children the foods that they chose. It was the Twinkies, it was the sodas. In school, we would give them foods. And now in Congress, that in the next few months, that's going to be one of the hottest topics mm -hmm. will be, should we give kids foods that are you know, healthy by some experts' view, or should we give them foods that they like and they eat? You know, so that actually is a, a very important public policy topic right now, and I want to know if any of you wanted to talk just briefly about public policy solutions and the structure, the food systems, the corporations, the, the government you know, roles. I mean, what public policy solutions do you think we could just introduce here before we open it up to the questions from the audience? Are there solutions that you can think of that you'd like to mention that will kind of pique the Well, I'll know, talk quickly here? about a policy that's in existence. The sure. Healthy Free, in 2010, the president passed the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which placed um, limits on the amount of protein and um, it also required more fresh fruits and vegetables and the School Nutrition Association, an organization I've been a part of for 25 years, is uh, uh, through, through their Congress folks are trying to roll back some of those requirements. And what I would say to you quite simply, they, I would, they shouldn't be rolled back. Uh, we're making significant progress. In 1997, um, we had the first uh, salad bar in, in public schools, and today we have it in all 50 states mm -hmm. and over 2,000 schools around the country. So that's important. What I would argue to you is that if your child had a illness and a doctor told you that that illness could be addressed and eradicated, when would you want the treatment? Mm -hmm. You'd want it now. You don't roll it back because it's hard. There's a reason why we call it work. And more <laughs> importantly, what I would say to all of you is, what wouldn't you do for your child? We should want for all children what we want for our own children. And that's really the problem that I have, is we talk good about our own children. But out of sight, out of mind, and we're not concerned. We want to throw out things like pull themselves up by the bootstraps mm -hmm. or what we did. The fact of the matter is uh, we've got people out there hurting, and we are a brother's keeper. Yep. Oh, thank you. And Hillary had something on public policy, too. Thank yeah. you, Rodney. Um, so I'm going to give you my top three and a half public policy pushes um, because I don't think that individual level change is effective here. We have to make environmental change. We yes. have to make healthy choices easy choices, or we are just 
pushing at a rock that we can't get up the hill. So these are my top four. Number one, SNAP or CalFresh or formerly food stamps, whatever you want to call it, it works, but it is woefully underfunded, and yes. that is a tragedy. We think if it smooths out these coping strategies, and we know after controlling for selection bias that, it, that people are less obese when they're on SNAP. Number two, as Rodney says, I just want to emphasize it, schools represent an extraordinary opportunity. Kids are in school so much, and they're in the schools during the times when their eating habits, their lifelong eating habits are being put down. We have to take that opportunity and use it, as Rodney says. Third, I'm a big proponent of fruit and vegetable vouchers. When you increase the amount of money that people have in low-income communities for fruits and vegetables, it supports vendors in trying to stock a really perishable product that economically they have trouble stocking because there isn't adequate demand in the neighborhood. And then my half solution, so I'm going so fast, but mm -hmm. I don't want to take up other mm -hmm. people's time. My half solution is we know that non-food related public policies matter and that if you can relieve poverty in other ways, people can eat better. What does this mean? Minimum wage laws, affordable health care, affordable housing. These things make a difference in the kinds of foods that people are able to buy and we can't shy away from these controversial issues because they're not technically food related. Okay, good. And Julie, I was, I was going to make the same point, but more. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that one that we clapped on. We'll, cl <laughs> yeah. we'll clap for you, no, too. Okay. No, I, 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 I am in complete concurrence, and I, and I think that in addition, I mean, we need to, we need to tackle the policy battle, battles that are the harder ones. I think that what's happened, and this is my, my kind of friendly critique of the alternative food movement, we've been very good at kind of these kind of bringing good food into, into particular schools and setting up farmers markets in particular places, but we still need to do the, the hard stuff. And it, like, let's take schools. Why, wh what are some of the reasons that school lunches have became so debilitated? Well, it was because California passed Proposition 13 and there was fewer property taxes to have good nutrition in the schools and so the schools started contracting out for um, for food services, so we need tax reform. Um, we need so many things well beyond food, but also we need to. The other thing I want to emphasize is we need to focus more policy on how food is produced, not only on how and where it's consumed. And this is why I go back to the environmental toxins. There is strong um, evidence that shows a relationship between toxins and and diabetes. Um, uh, Hormones in, in beef, right? So DES, I, I can't talk too long about DES, but DES was um, banned a long time ago because women who uh, took DES to prevent miscarriages had all, their, their children had all sorts of um, reproductive cancers and infertility. Well, D, analogs of DES are being used every day to feed up, to feed our livestock. And there's been studies that show that DES this is one. This is one of the toxins. That, uh, the DES um, creates fat cells in utero, so people or animals become obese later. So, we have a whole livestock system filled with synthetic hormones that seem to relate to obesity and possibly diabetes. So here again, we need, but we don't. We're not talking about regulating our food system in, in those kind of ways because there's the hard political battles. But those are the ones we have to take on. Okay, well, thank you. Well, now I think it's time to open it up. So we um, have given you lots of things to think about. So let's start um, way in the back, and then we're going to move up to, so the man in the back, and then we'll move up to the woman in the third row. This is about okay. policy and politics. We have ballot measures in Berkeley and San Francisco on the soda tax. Your comments, please. Okay, who would like to talk about that? Okay, Lori is going to uh, I think it it's uh, just like I was saying, food, uh, I think food can be such a powerful organizing tool. And uh, I think uh, it, the, these measures have, uh, I think, galvanized the whole po population. Of course, the, the foodies are on top of this. But the non-foodies uh, who live in Berkeley and San Francisco have to you know, engage now about the issue of food and obesity and the corporate, uh, the role that the corporations uh, play in causing poor health and obesity. And it's a fabulous example of how, I mean, I never would have imagined that we would have this debate going on 
uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when we first started talking about the obesity, it seemed impossible that we could ever take on the soda industry. And here we are, about to win D, right? Yes on D. <laughs> Great. Okay. I would thank just, you. I would like to respond yeah, to that ahead. for a second. Um, I'm always hesitant to demonize food, any foods, because we all know moderation is the key. I'd have to tell you that um, it, on my way to the car, I'll probably pick up a soda. I'm, <laughs> I'm tired and I got a two hour drive. And so uh, I, I don't want to demonize food. I'm not trying to turn every child into a vegan. Uh, <laughs> all I really want to do is, if it's the school program, when, and she hit on it, it's funding. You, you, we give $3 for a meal. Can somebody in here go and get a <laughs> cup of coffee from Starbucks for $3? Never mind a lunch. It, it just can't be done. And so whether it's snap it, whether it's uh, um, schools, and I love what she talked about, the illustrations she gave you with policy, because it's really about policy. Policy sets, it tells us where our priorities are. And our priorities ought to be here at home. Okay, good. Okay, we have our second question here. Um, I'm looking at this from more of a programmatic side. So I actually run all the YMCAs in Oakland and we're really interested in kind of snatching up the out of school time hours and mirroring some of the same messages. But it's a little bit shocking to me that when I ask for scalable solutions, kind of all the experts say, yeah, we're looking for that. And I'm wondering what you guys could tell us about scalable okay. solutions. Well, clarify what you mean by scalable so we can be sure we respond. All the students and families in Oakland that need us during out of school time hours. Who are going to YMCA's? <laughs> no, all of them. All of them. Oh, oh, that's so my, my point is when we talk about the statistics and we're talking about one in three, one in four, two in three, I think the YMCA is making some inroads around working around prediabetes and really having a scalable program that we can look nationwide to implement. I'm wondering what that scalable program looks like or what elements it has to reach as many kids and families as possible quickly. I think the conspicuous silence is some agreement that it's been really hard to find those solutions. And that's what I think brings us back to this, we are going to have to make some really tough environmental changes and stop trying to reach everybody in an individual level. Rodney brought up the example of smoking, which is a phenomenal example because we really learned from the smoking public health success that we have to hit this on multiple levels. And it was really important to work at the individual level. And we needed physicians telling, patient, telling patients to stop. And we needed advertisements telling patients to stop. But we needed those environmental changes. That not at all answers your question, but I think it reinforces how challenging this has been. But if you want to talk later, I have a few ideas for some people who you might want to talk to. Mm -hmm. I think we have actually an episode. Well, I, I, um, I want to recommend CanFit, which is in downtown Berkeley. Have you met with them? No. So Arnell Hinkle, who's the director of CanFit, she's probably done the last 10 or 15 years yes. developing after school programs for especially middle school kids. And the, the interesting story about that is that CanFit was originally funded by a class action suit against, was it General Foods or mm -hmm. General Mills? Yeah. That was advertising junk cereal to kids. And when the class action suit was won in California, the settlement went to develop this program. So I'm sad to think that you've been looking around and here, right here in Berkeley, uh, I mean, I don't think she solved the problem, but I don't know anyone who's thought more about it than her. Um, so, mm -hmm. but while I have the mic, can I say something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Okay, so good. I would just like to put in a, um, I want to I wanna, uh, endorse everything that people have said about the policy changes. My work is particularly around pregnant women, and, um, and as is Lori's and WIC. But um, by the time a woman becomes pregnant, and this is something that I think I feel very comfortable to say that while you can certainly be obese and have a healthy baby, um, obesity has ravaged perinatal health even in the United States. It increases maternal mortality, which is such a rare event that we used to think we had made it go, go away, and it's increasing, and part of that is due to obesity, and particularly in minority women. 
Um, there, the rat studies, mice studies that you talked about, about chemicals that, in, that are sh have been shown to increase obesity. Um, we know there's something, a methylation process, where if, a, if, a, if, a, if an animal eats a very healthy diet, um, genes are turned off that might otherwise cause obesity and chronic diseases in the offspring. And there's growing evidence that that is also true in humans. Um, and so that is an example where obesity itself, not just gestational diabetes, mm -hmm. not the outcome, the outcome, health, chronic disease outcomes of obesity, in young people um, sets the trajectory that may make it harder for children, even if they eat a healthy diet, to avoid obesity mm -hmm. or other kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want to bring that up is because when a woman becomes pregnant, there's a lot of lip service about them eating a healthy diet. But until we change the environment, it's really cruel. It's really cruel, and it's especially cruel if a woman is poor. Right. <laughs> because mm -hmm. if, if she can't eat a healthy diet, um, if, if we're not all eating healthy diets in general, then this person gets this extra responsibility, which right. is making new life, and they're in an environment where they are pushing the rock up the hill. And so I just wanted to say that, that that kind of is the model that you might keep in your head, that there is this moment, this teachable moment in this population where we might be able to turn things around way before the kids get to school. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, unless we change the environment, we're not able to, ch to help these people in general. Mm -hmm. That's great, and it brings us right back to the YMCA issue, that the environment means every place a child goes, whether it's an after-school program, or it's a vending machine. You know, we as adults, if we're protecting our children from chronic disease, that's the kind of protection that we need. We need full access to healthy foods. Go ahead, Lori. But I, I do think that, I think the pendulum uh, for several years in the obesity kind of uh, debate and intervention sort of community uh, including both government and funders, has swung uh, pretty heavily in the, in the direction of environmental and policy change. Mm -hmm. If we just get environmental and policy change, you know, the p poor people will just sort of wander into a store and get the right foods. If we just change the schools, the kids will eat healthy. Mm -hmm. If we just, you know, improve the WIC food packages, everything's going to be fine with the WIC people. It doesn't work that way with food. Hello? People make decisions about what they're going to put in their mouths every day, many times a day. And they are agents. They have efficacy. They're not, you know, clueless. And poor people in particular are per particularly not clueless. They're trying to get by with less, and they're doing an amazing job. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very unfair to low-income populations and low-income communities to think that these, these, you know, environmental sort of solutions can be sort of imposed on them. Food itself, as I've said before, can be an amazing tool for not only personal change, but social change. And the, the increased demand, if somebody, you tell somebody you need to breastfeed, and they say, I can't breastfeed because the nurse at the hospital didn't even tell me how to do it. She gave my baby formula while, while I was still asleep. <laughs> and then you can say, you can help us reform that hospital. Let's go to that hospital and raise hell. Mm. And that's what I mean by using food as an organizing tool in low-income communities. They get it, and mm -hmm. they need, you know, they don't need somebody telling them why they should eat well. They need the skills, like Rodney's mm -hmm. saying. They need the hows, not the whys. And once you give them the how, they'll go at it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important thing. There, there, there needs to be a balance between this environmental and policy change and the personal agency and efficacy that every person has around food. Okay, okay. And now we have a question up at the top here. Um, so this is a question specifically for Professor Guthman, but I'd, I'd really like to hear other people weigh in. Um, and thank you for just raising this idea of um, raising hell, because that's a little bit of what I want to address. Um, <laughs> so Guthman, uh, you mentioned in your book this hyper-focus on individual consumption is one of the things that masks some of the root structural causes, like capitalism. And mm -hmm. you even mentioned it on the stage, and it, capitalism becomes a word that we all start laughing about. And it, it becomes kind of a, a joke, as in, like, we can't actually tackle that. Let's get back to the serious business at hand. <laughs> um, and as a young, you know, quote-unquote, idealistic person who still thinks that it's uh, my generation's responsibility to address things like an austerity economy that's robbing us of our control over land, water, uh, the ability to even save our own seeds is under threat. Um, the ability to make choices about what we eat, because I don't have complete choice when I go to uh, a for-profit marketplace. 
right? So I am really inspired by things that are happening on a global level where groups like the MST are both working with policy in Brazil, trying to work with the government, mm -hmm. but are also on a grassroots level directly engaging in acts of civil disobedience that are reclaiming millions of acres of land mm -hmm. right now, um, currently happening. So the question that I want to pose to you is really this notion of uh, civil disobedience and more hell-raising tactics that folks that have the ability uh, who can engage in those things um, could do. What do you think the role of that is in the United States? Huh. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, I don't, have, I don't get that one often. Um, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I know, I have such a hard time convincing people that we need to think about these bigger <laughs> pictures and, and not about changing the world one meal at a time. But I'm, I don't really go into tactics too much. I'm a, I'm a bit of a policy person more than a kind of, uh, you know, civil, civil disobedience person, to be honest. Um, so, um, and I, th you know, I think that our tactics need to be focused, you know, they need to be strategic. And so uh, what I do think is that tactically we ought to do more to change corporate behavior. Um, and, but I don't know exactly how to do it. It's not the kind of thing I, I think about. Um, there are times for civil disobedience. There's times for the hard work of being in the trenches and doing the, the, the policy work that many young people today don't want to touch because they haven't seen a successful policy victory in a very, very long time. And that's what I come up against with my students. Um, but from, this doesn't exactly answer your question, but what I've come to see is that the more we give up on the policy world, the more the policy world becomes una unattainable to change. Um, and so um, for, um, I th there's a bit of an idealism to look, at, to look at moments like MST and get carried away with that when, you know, again, when you think about an African American in West Oakland who needs a, a good meal, and is, is civil disobedience a thing, or is it really fighting harder to increase SNAP benefits? You know, which I'm, so that doesn't really answer your question, although I'm happy to say that I think capitalism's the problem. <laughs> okay, <laughs> And Lori would like to address it I as well. I uh, think, uh, particularly with the way the corporation, uh, basically we're in a very bad situation in, in our uh, current nation because of Civil, um, the uh, Supreme Court ruling on corporations are people, and right. essentially we have an oligarchy going on in Congress right. where the corporations are kind of starting to run things. And I certainly see that in, in, in the food industry. Uh, you know, the incursion into the School Nutrition Association, the, the cereal companies are now on my case in the WIC program. Why do you have such uh, low sugar, you know, low sugar, uh, you know, bar in, in WIC, and we want more sugar, and you know, they're mm -hmm. pressuring WIC. Uh, and shame is a great tactic, especially in a high information, highly knowledgeable, and particularly since you go to UC Berkeley and you're trained to be researchers, research corporations and expose their malfeasance. Yep. That's the really good uh, tactic for you guys. You, you don't have to hit the hustings and, you know, pick it and, you know, occupy McDonald's. You've got the skills to, to expose corporations and shame them. And shame really works better than any kind of, uh, you know, regulation. Yeah, so I mean, go for that. Yeah, I just <laughs> want to jump in on that. I mean, if you look at if you look at the an, um, the anti -bio biotechnology movement, um, it's you, you might say, well, how can we say that's a success? There's biotechnology applications everywhere, but it's been it's taken a. It, there will be many more biotech agricultural biotechnology applications today were it not for a very um, organized movement that worked hard to deliver good science, and that and that and strategically tried to look looked at the strategic weaknesses of the biotechnology industry and played them off of them. And this is written about in Rachel Sherman and William Monroe's fantastic book, Fighting for the Future of Food. Um, so it is about finding corporate vulnerabilities and, and amplifying them and play, and, and without that, we'd see many, many more applications of biotechnology today. Hi there. Great. Because we didn't get close to your answer, yeah. I did write a paper on uh, Where's the Rage? Yeah. And uh, it, it rage was, is good too. And yeah. that, that rage was, where's the rage from parents yeah. that we're not yeah. concerned yeah. that our children are at threat? Do we have to wait till it's us personally? Mm -hmm. um, the, the statistics alone ought to scare us to death. Yeah. Um, 
And so I agree, as a researcher, you have the ability to expose. Uh, case in point, um, on the 23rd, there's 14 school districts in California who are committed to serving only California grown. Part of that is, is we'll all be buying um, antibiotic free chicken. Mm -hmm. um, because the corporations are shooting the chickens with antibiotics that they don't even need. They, they, don't have it, they haven't developed anything. They're shooting it so they won't develop it. And what's happening is they're creating a superbug right. that the antibodies can't um, attack. So we should be very concerned about that. When you talk about what can you do, you can reveal what we don't have the ability to do on the ground. Um, and um, because big business is, is worried about dollars, you know. Just go and look at the yeah. food that you're buying and what's in it. A lot of sugar. A lot of things that you can't even pronounce. You guys probably could. You at UC Berkeley, but I, I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> okay, thank you. And one up here. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for this really far-reaching and broad conversation about these important issues. I think that we really measure the priorities of a society by how much money they're willing to spend on any given issue. And so as we look at the $3 trillion wars mm -hmm. that we engaged in over the last decade plus, uh, and we compare that to an unchanged funding for school meals at the time that they actually required 60 cents of change, they funded six cents. Mm -hmm. And at the time that WIC changed its package to include more fruits and vegetables, they required it to be revenue neutral. Right. And so, you know, these things should really alarm and, you know, really make us enraged. Mm -hmm. And they deserve to be shamed. But mm -hmm. as they say in the elevator of the Citizen Hotel in Sacramento, you know, bad people are elected by the good people that didn't vote. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we really need to be aware of and push for people participating in the process, even if you feel like you're holding your nose. It really mm -hmm. does matter who gets elected because the fact that we now have this sort of, um, let's call it cost decontrol over who can fund campaigns is resulting in a very skewed legislative body that then determines the funding for programs like school meals and summer meals and snack programs and the things that we need in order to support people and help them be healthy. And to give you a point of comparison, in France where kids are allowed an hour and a half to eat lunch because they consider it an important part of their social and personal development, they actually expend eight to $14 per lunch. And we're mm -hmm. trying to make do, particularly in a high rent district like the Bay Area, with not quite $3. Yeah. And so, you know, this is something we really need to be concerned about and fight about and stink about. Um, and when you're talking about shame, the minute pink slime came out and it was in social media, that went bye-bye. Everybody couldn't trip fast enough over themselves to say they weren't using it. So, you know, there are tactics and things that can be used, but, you know, we have to sort of keep our eye on the kind of bigger picture that if we don't care about policy and we don't care about who makes decisions, then we're subject to their decisions. Oh, do we have time for one more, Anne? Okay, okay great, thank you. And, and did anybody like to address Laura's comments, or should we take another no, question? Slow. She okay, right on. No. Good. Okay, one here and then one down in the front. This is a question about uh, public health research in general. It seems like a lot of the problem identification relies on public health uh, epidemiology, which is often at the scale of an individual body or sometimes even a cohort or a community. And that seems to mean that the solutions are also at that level, you know, behavior change, individual bodies or cohorts. And I wonder, is there any evidence within the public health field to shift to a more systems uh, level research and how can the kind of history of public health shift to adapt to some of these greater problems? Because we know that the, the problems are much more complex than you know, individual calories in, calories out. Mm -hmm. I think, Hillary, you might be the best one, being that she really is calling for the, the bigger solution, the system solution, yet she teaches in epidemiology and, and medicine. Yeah, I mean, let me step back from that background, though. The first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is to reflect back on my experience doing advocacy and research at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level. And that has really convinced me that 
unless you are living in Washington and have a really and have a really famous name, all change is local. <laughs> so don't feel the word that's coming to mind is bond. What's the, what's the <laughs> technical word? That's, um, don't feel chagrined that you don't have the power to make change because these environmental and policy solutions, the vast majority of them, of the effective ones, are local changes that we all can contribute to and we all have power over. I agree that the federal government has a huge responsibility here and reforming SNAP would go a long way towards um, abating the food insecurity crisis. That being said, um, we, have to, we have to think local because so many of our environmental solutions are local. Then coming back to your other question about how do we get this sort of wider framework on the problem, um, I'm not sure the answer to that except that to say this is an extraordinarily complex problem as the other panelists have mentioned. And as researchers, we try to pick apart those problems because it's the only way that we can study them. We can only study them easily many times in a community or in a locality. The challenge then for us is to be able to parse all of those very small research studies into a bigger picture understanding of what obesity is and how we're going to address it. And you're right, we haven't done an adequate job of, it, of that. Mm -hmm. And this is a great, you know, for all you students out here, take this on because th we need to have that bigger picture understanding in order to inform our local policy decisions. Mm -hmm. Great question, thank you. Okay, d there's one down here and then should we take one more? Okay. Could I just okay. say one thing about the public health, you know, approach to, pro you know, complex problems? I, in, in recent years, I've seen design thinking uh, start to slip into <laughs> public health, and I think that's one of the ways to, to try to put this bigger frame on a, a traditional approach. Yeah. Somewhat helps. Okay. That sounds good. And so I think with that, we are going to wrap right now. And the, those of you who had questions, I think we'll be around for a few minutes. So you can come on down. But I wanted to thank each and every one of the panelists. I, in particular, I wanted to start with Hillary, who gave us some lists that I think we'll all remember, those lists. And it's kind of like the Letterman Show lists. And, and that was very important. So and I also wanted to thank Rodney for bringing up the social justice issue that that is the frame that I think we need to be thinking of in this issue with when the obesity and the diabetes both are so high in the, these populations that um, we are our brother's keepers. And then of course, Lori so eloquently talked about food as an organizing tool. We can't go too far down the health route without touching on food. And when we touch on food, there's so many aspects of it, but the organizing issue is one that I don't think we think of enough. And it is so true. I'm watching Berkeley and San Francisco right now, and I've never seen anything like it. So I don't know how the election will come out, but I know that we are changed because of the dialogue that we've been having on sugar in our children's diets and sugar in our society and sugar as it replaces all the things that do create health. And of course, um, how could I not end by saying that we appreciate so much Julie's, you know, bringing us to the tactics and whether it's shame or rage or corporate behavior or civil disobedience as it was brought up in the audience and, and the root structural changes and the policies that can touch on those. I think this is the framing that we all need to really be addressing now and thinking more about how we can tackle such a complex problem as we all have said here today, but using these things that were brought up so eloquently by all the speakers. So now I'd like to give all of you a big hand for sharing your <laughs>could I also add my thanks and thanks to Pat for facilitating and moderating a great panel. We're really delighted to have this in incredible diversity of perspectives this afternoon and thank you all for coming. We'd like to invite you out. We do have a reception in the hallway just around the corner so you can continue the exchange. A few of you didn't get a chance to ask questions so you're Please um, you know, approach this, uh, our panelists and engage in that conversation. I also want to invite you to our next event, which um, um, some of you are on our mailing list, but we are having a, another forum uh, a month from now. It's November 17th, 
and it will be held at the Alumni House, and the topic is, is going to be on urban farming and the health and social impacts. So we're going to have a, even a more participatory dialogue in that, that event. So please um, join us, and thank you again for coming today.